welcome to another episode of The Platform and great fun to have Nathan Corbett on the show. He was known as Carnage and this is why. unbelievable career and uh, we've known each other for about 15 years always been good mates and it was great fun to contact him and uh, get him to jump on Skype and have him on the platform it's good to have you on the show Nathan how's things going well there Togsy good how are you (laughs) mate you've been traveling all over the world you've been traveling everywhere so we'll get to that shortly but uh, you know I love doing a show about stories as you know so let's let's go back mate let's talk about the beginning of this incredible fight career you had and how did it all start yeah, no, it all started actually, um, I think I've said before, like the Karate Kid story. Um, I was like, I think I was 13, grade 8 in high school, about 13 and a half years old. And, and um, in the playground one day, one of my friends just decided the king hit me. Oh. And um, it kind of just like, you know, sent a message to me that day. I was just like, oh, I was riding home from school just thinking, what was that all about? And I don't want that to happen to me again. And if it does, you know, I want to at least know what I'm doing and defending myself if, if I have to or whatnot. But uh, I went home that day and just something sparked a fire inside me to think, well, you know, I need to, I need to learn how to fight. That was my first thoughts, of course. Um, so then I said to my dad, Dad, I need a box. I want to be, I want to be a boxer because the guy that punched me was a boxer. So I thought, I need to be a boxer. And he said, no, 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 you're not doing that. It's a mugs game. You're not doing that, which, you know, at 13, I didn't quite understand what he meant by that. But, I um, believe it. within the same time, my mum had been out at a restaurant and she got this one-month free karate training. So now that I look back, it was meant to be that I was meant to start in the martial arts versus just, you know, just boxing because it's taught me so much more than just fighting. And so I ended up doing karate and that's where it all, all began. Awesome, man. Years. So then how did sort of Muay Thai come into the picture? Because that's a bit different from karate. Yeah, after about two years of training karate, I, I met um, uh, my first Muay Thai teacher. It was a friend, my next door neighbor's uh, friend. So, you, you know, you should really do Thai boxing and have a look at it. I'm like, oh, okay. And because I hadn't really even heard about it until then. And then I um, went and did a few lessons and thought, this is, you know, this is better. This is a bit more, a bit more contact, a bit more brutal, a bit more <laughs> real and stuff. So I I kept doing karate. I didn't quit karate. I I kept doing karate from 14 to all all the way through to when I was 20. So I did six years of karate, second degree black belt and stuff. But I, I, at 16, I started Muay Thai as well. So I was sort of cross training between the two of them. Um, Yes, that's kind of where Muay Thai, I guess it was more like, I liked the idea of, you know, the the elbows and the the full contact style of fighting that Thai boxing has and, and, and being a stand-up sport as well. So, well, there's, good, there's, there's great great scenes in the Karate Kid where Mr. Miyagi is telling daniel son that karate is for defense only and you learn so you don't have to fight, but yet you start Muay Thai and start destroying people. It must have been a bit weird when you <laughs> go back to karate classes. <laughs> I know, it's funny because when I started to put my Thai boxing into my karate, you know, some people would say, oh, that's a foul, you can't hold your hands that way, or you can't elbow, or you can't leg kick like that, you know, like, and but my teacher at the time, I think he, he knew he couldn't stop me, so he kind of just let me do my thing, and I'd go and enter in these full contact karate tournaments on my own, outside of outside of my karate school, and I'd just go and do like help machine full contact with no head punch, so he could full leg kicks and everything, so I was bringing in that into the... <laughs> early days of my karate career and then yeah I guess it just was a slow progression and then by the time I 
uh, finished school, I was, was still sort of heavily involved with karate because I was teaching a lot then. And then when I was about 19, 20, I just um, made the full transition and just dropped all karate training, just put my Thai boxing trunks on and ended up in a Thai boxing gym and that was it. I never looked back as far as any other martial art was concerned. Mate, it was such a like meteoric rise when you when you started Muay Thai. I mean, I don't know that much about the sport, but I remember you were just always winning and just smashing, dude. So what was that like for those first few years when you were just knocking people out? Yeah, I think, um, like, well, 2000, I sort of started the, the career as such. Um, and then 2001, I got my first Australian title, like, uh, fight, which was a professional fight after, like, six fights. So my seven fights was like an elbow fight, you know, which I've been training for five years to to be throwing elbows, and it finally come to that day. We've got an Australian title, professional, and then I won that fight. I was Australian champion, and then like within the next sort of twelve months, I won like two or three more Australian titles, and then I got offered in two thousand three uh, a world title fight, which I didn't, I didn't even expect it coming. It, was, it wasn't like I was searching for it. My promoter. At the time, just said, oh, I've got your world title fight. I was just like, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think I'd had like 19 fights or something. Wow. You know, like my 20th fight and um, fought the Clifton Brown, which is a Canadian. And uh, he'd be living in Thailand at Sit Sok Manong and training over there. And he was a um, well credited opponent. But then I ended up knocking him out in the first round with an elbow. So then all of a sudden, from my fights before that, elbowing people and then doing the, the first win by a KO. Is a, for a world title, it was like the man with the golden elbows was sort of like where it kind of launched, and there was sort of where I feel like it really took off. Goes through a knee to the thigh, crossing elbow there from Nathan Corbett. Pops out the jab, just got to. Oh, there! The hand elbow is out cold! That's good night, Irene! The big buck try, and Nathan Corbett is a champion of the world! So how do you find, like, the balance outside the ring for you? I mean, we've had so many coffees over the years, I can't recall how many thousands, but yeah. you're, it's weird My to think... Buddy, I miss you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to think of you as this, like, wrecking machine because outside you're so placid and everything, but is it, is it weird for you to balance that out when you're fighting? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, like, most people who I meet um, outside of the, the gym, they wouldn't, you know ever perceive that that's what I would do especially now that I'm retired from fighting and I'm living in America and I'm you know meeting new people all the time that just have no clue about my past no clue about what I've done but then they meet me in that first you know impression of course it's like oh kind kind gentleman and and then so I'm say, oh he's, this guy's 11 times world champion he like elbows people he's like knocked all they're like oh my god I didn't, couldn't imagine you being a fighter <laughs> So it is an interesting thing, it happens all the time. And I think it really just come from that switch of like, from when I was young, it wasn't about I wanted to be a fighter because I was like angry and wanted to hurt people. It was more like I wanted to learn how to fight if I needed to. So it was more of a switch between switching on and off. So I'm not always on running around angry or aggressive or violent or feeling, you know, like threatening people. It was always just a matter of more like the, the, the whole karate kid thing. Mr. Miyagi thing about just like, you know, having that mind and, and training and, and keeping it, it there in case but not really using it. So, yeah, the peaceful warrior, as you would say. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, mate, let's talk about the career then because um, when you look back on it now, what were some of the, the major highlights for you? Yeah, I guess um, the biggest highlights for me now because when people talk about me or introduce me, to people, it's like, oh, this is Nathan Corbett from, you know, he's from Australia. He was like 11 times world champion, and they're like, whoa, 11 world titles, wow, that's crazy. And people get excited about that. But I think for me, what I'm more proud of is not so much the 11 belts, I'm more proud of like being world champion in three different weight divisions. So if I only ever had three belts, I'd be happy. Wouldn't matter about the other ones because some of them were like title defenses and they give you another belt. But I was pretty proud that I won like you know, three different world titles in different weight divisions. And for 10 years, as a world champion in Muay Thai, I was undefeated. So when, when I stood, stood in the ring as a Muay Thai fighter, I was undefeated. And any world title fight I was ever 
given the opportunity whether I was going for a new vow or I was defending it, I was undefeated. So that's kind of where I'd look back and say I'm more proud of that versus the actual number 11. Please make welcome... Carnage controlling centre ring. Has yet to open up with any real salvos. Cries for the first crossing elbow. Off the right arm. Well, that's going to be the defining difference here with Carnage. Those razor sharp. He's the king of the elbow. And, of course, McKinnon is the powerhouse. So, Nathan Carnage has the momentum now. Can he try and finish it here in the second round? Outside thigh kick from McKinnon, but he has been rattled. Fighters are defined, I guess, by the people that they're sort of competing with, and they have these arch enemies and nemesises and everything. And I think you, for a long time there, Steve McKinnon was that for you in Australia, and people can Google yes. it on YouTube. But what was it like with you and Steve at that time? Oh yeah, <laughs> that was a. I, don't, I, I kind of even still just keep it that way now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> not that we ever see we ever see each other or talk to each other, but. I just keep that one in the bank, you know, in case there's ever a three. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the rivalry was really just um, probably more the fans than it was like us individually. Like I think, like, especially when I look back at the first fight in 2006, it was all about, you know, his fans, you know, trying to like shit can me all over like the forums and stuff. And where my fans were just like, oh, Nathan's the best, you know, when that's just it. So I think it was more so the fans than it was like individually, Steve. Or myself, and then uh, we, we fought again, of course, in 2012, and I won again. So that sort of would have, you know, shattered him a bit, I guess, to know that, you know, he'd always be under under me when it comes to like Australian Muay Thai. Yeah. But, you know, that's how it is. Listen to this place! It is pandemonium! This fight is almost uh, reminiscent of McKinnon and uh, Paul Sawinski about. Oh, he's cut him! Oh, he's cut him! He's bleeding between the eyes. McKinnon's cut him. How long has it been since we've seen Carnage cut him up? Well, I think, it, as you said earlier, it's just infuriated him more, but uh, the fighting spirit of the McKinnons is coming through now for sure. This is phenomenal. Wherever you're watching around the world, we hope you're enjoying it. The Carnage has been cut in the fourth round. That was a great rivalry. He's a good bloke, Steve, and uh, it's it's. Uh... Yeah, yeah, he is a good bloke. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's just he's a tough guy. He's an absolute warrior. Yeah, yeah, strong man, very strong man. I mean, you know, we could fight three times, and you know, he, he, he we could fight five times, and maybe I win three, he wins two. You know, he knows, but but now it's two nil. <laughs> and I remember, uh, you know, the Tyrone Spong thing was a good build up too, and of course, what happened in Jamaica. But that must have been pretty amazing for you going through that. Yeah, of course. Tyrone Swong, interesting enough, Tyrone Swong and I, out of all like all the opponents, you know, that I've fought over the years, like and not that I speak to him every day, but we've actually become quite, you know, close and friends through uh, via Instagram. Actually I spoke to him on the phone as well now I'm living in America of course, so we've been sort of, you know, texting back here and there and he's looking forward to me to go visit him and hang out and stay at his house and stuff. So it's interesting that that was another whole. Here's that one was definitely not a fans one. That was definitely an ego one. Where Tyrone back in 2009, which was the first fight in Jamaica, he was very ego centric, very driven, egotistically, and was like the king and, and the man in Holland, you know. And um, of course, you know that first fight didn't go so good for him. And then we rematched in 2013. It didn't go so good for me. So. <laughs> But I guess we won one. We won uh, one each, and then I, I believe because the he, you know, is such a you know a warrior and a fighter, and he's growing as well. Like he's you know in his thirties now, he's not so as he was back when he was younger. Probably a little bit more immature as far as ego is concerned, and now he's more humble and 
knows that I was a warrior and knocked him out and put him flat. So there's that, that neutral respect between both of us. So it's pretty cool. I'm going to win this fight for sure. As soon as the sound of the bell goes, it's on. It's going to be war. It's going to be a real war. Tyrone Sprung is the Nathan Corbett of Holland. He is the best fighter on that side of the world, and I'm the best on this side of the world. So for us two to fight, it's the greatest, you know. Tyrone Spong, good, a high forearms gun, takes a leg kick to the outside lead thigh, returns the favour to the inside thigh, curling over the top hand there. And again, Spong with the right hand. This right is the this big kibosh! The big kibosh! I told you the counter fight! I told you the counter fight! Nathan Corbett in a daze here on one knee! Polo Touch is gonna count him out! Corbett's out! No, he makes it! He barely makes the count! I told you the counter fighting of Spong! Corbett in trouble. A long way to go in this round. So he's, uh, he's throwing in the switch hitting now, Carnage, in an attempt to confound the uh, the attacks of, of Spong. Spong still on the front foot. It's usually the way we're used to in Australia seeing Nathan Corbett being the aggressor. Let's now look at this as well. Nathan Corbett has been... Oh! The big kibosh! 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 Spong is down. It's over. It is over. He's not going to get up from this. What's life like, mate, for you with, uh, you know, the, like now, uh, when you look back on your career, and I know you went through some pretty tough times too, emotionally, with dealing with a lot of different things, but like, how, how did you find that journey after the, after you sort of stopped fighting? Yeah, it's, it was really brutal, you know, and as you know, being my friend, like, we shared many stories about that, but it was, it was such a brutal period of my life because I think like any athlete, you know, never really wants to finish what they're doing because like if you're an athlete to start with obviously you're super passionate about what you do because that's what separates you especially if you're a champion as well and then when that comes to an end it wasn't like i just decided that i picked a, a date like okay april 12 2014 is going to be my last fight and i'm going to enjoy retirement and live ha- happily ever after <laughs> I fought up to I fought April 12, 2014, you know, and then I um, come back to Australia to recover from an injury from the fight. And just after months and months of sort of like recovering, I just felt like the wheels just started to fall off. And I just didn't feel like I had the, the same uh, physical strength and, and ability to train at that level anymore. And just started, the reality started to come clear to me that I, I couldn't step back in and fight against the best fighters in the world when I was you know, pushing 35. So it was really hard because it was kind of a feeling of being taken away from me without choice. Right. So it left me not with a plan of attack or a second plan. So I kind of lost for a few years trying to figure out, like, what do I do next? Because, you know, I like to live in passion. I don't like to just do something because you have to do it or work a job because you have to work. I just, I've, I've never worked. I've always done things that I love because that was what I felt that, you know, our purpose is to do this, this earth, you know. So what are you up as, to now then? You're... As you do yourself, you know, you're always chasing your dreams. So. Yeah. Well, you're in the States now. How did that sort of come about? Uh, well, that came from, um, from again, searching and seeking through that, that, that journey of, like, traveling, doing seminars. I've done, like, 130 seminars all around the world. And through traveling through America, I kind of, like, just thought, you know, I think this is going to probably be a good place to, to land. Um, based on, it was only based on the, the, the knowledge that America is bigger, has more people, there's more TV, there's more media, there's more of this kind of um, reflection in the US. So I just thought, based on those figures, I kind of took a gamble on that and thought, well, my hometown, the Gold Coast, is like beautiful, you know, you would never want to leave there, but I thought I needed to, to move away for a new opportunity because my flight career was no longer there anymore, so it was needing to look for a new platform. So I was lucky enough, one of my good friends and one of my old sponsors, he, he helped me out with his lawyers and we, we got all the paperwork and I got a three-year visa straight away. And, uh, yes, yeah, so that's how I kind of made that happen. I've been here for one year already. And now yeah. you're commentating fights over there, mate. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's super exciting. So um, when I first got here, like I wanted to be a like I said, talked about being here for the exposure in the media world. And then the Lion Fight commentary gig came up late November last year. 
And um, then after that show, they said, we've got some exciting news. CBS Sports Network really like us. They want to give us 14 dates for the next year. Can you commit to every show? We want you to be the caller, which is the technical um, advisor, commentary for every show. Can you do that? And I said, boom, hand up. Yeah, I'm <laughs> on. <laughs> so so it's, it's so amazing because it was like I had it on my wish list and I had it on my vision list to do. But when I got here, first six months, it, it wasn't showing up. So it was kind of like, oh, okay, it's just not there. It was a real struggle. Mm. And all of a sudden, it just it come and then it comes strong. And then the best thing about it is because it's Muay Thai. You know, and I spent my whole fight career being a Muay Thai fighter and this country is saturated with MMA, which is a, is, a, is a okay sport, but I'm not as passionate about it as Muay Thai. I love, what, I love Thai boxing. That's yeah. what I really and That's what I've done. So to be able to be involved with a, a strong brand in this country and then get on to um, a, a good TV position was, was super cool. And we're going international. I was in Italy last week. We are in Ireland at the start of the year. Um, we're going to Sweden and maybe the UK back to um, Ireland as well this year. Hey, when yeah. you look back on everything in your journey so far, it's been such a crazy ride, but what, what do you reckon you've learnt most about yourself? Uh, I think uh, one of the things I've learnt the most is like that fear is a waste of time. <laughs> like I've spent so many days after my fight career in fear and I've spent so many days in my fight career in a little bit of fear or, you know, if not fear, anxiousness or worry or whatnot or this kind of thing, and going through it all, I realised that it's kind of like, it's good to be anxious, it's good to be a little bit, like, respectful of, like, for example, your opponent, but I think that fear is, like, really, like, the sort of, like, the darkener of, like, the brightness that there can be in life, so the thing that I've probably learnt the most, and especially in the last five years, is that it's kind of pointless. Okay. And you know I love asking people about living ultimate dreams and you've had the crazy career, you've dominated at what you did, but like looking forward, what's the ultimate dream for you if you can live it? The ultimate dream? Um, well, I feel like I still like would love to pursue like more media and TV work. Um, I, I'm still not, I'm still haven't given up the idea of maybe getting to an action movie sometime. You never know. <laughs> you know if I'm in America, I'm on TV, stepping stones, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, and I'd love to eventually one day um, get to a point where I can also, you know, maybe even be a, a motivational speaker um, through through all my journey from from what we just spoke about, from the Karate Kid days right through the Thai boxing days through to the, you know, the mental downfall to the, you know, refining myself and developing myself in a new country and finding a new passion and also a new career, so... All those kind of you know, ups and downs and ups and downs. So I do like you know speaking and do like people. So awesome, man! Cool. Well, it's so yeah. good to feature you on the show and to catch up and uh, all the best with everything. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. It's good to be on the show and always supporting. So there you go, an awesome career and an awesome guy. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the platform. Mm.